Greetings to y'all from the Jeannie Spokane chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute. I'm Melanie Bell, president of the chapter. Michael Hamilton, our presenter tonight, received both his bachelor and master's of science degrees from Indiana University, separated by some service in the Army Corps of Engineers. A career in the U.S. Bureau of Mines was followed by another in the Washington Geological S Survey. Additional experience he obtained in teaching with road scholars, lecturing at local schools, and leading educational field trips. He's currently on the boards of Dishman Hills Conservancy in Spokane, Washington, and also on the board of the SH Floods Institute, the Cheney Spokane chapter. Tonight, you will hear Michael Hamilton share how the geology of the Spokane area reveals an interesting part of the glacial flood story and what happened when the dam burst. On behalf of the board of directors, I present to you, Michael Hamilton. Yes. Okay, at last. I shall repeat myself for the first few sentences. Good evening, once again, and welcome to tonight's talk that poses two questions. The first is what happened when the dam burst? And by the way, what happened when the dam burst again and again? The second the insurance question I can answer right away, probably not. I'm confident that any insurance policies issued in the Pleistocene's Great Ice Age would have had an exclusion clause for catastrophic glacial outburst floods. As for the first question though, we're gonna to have to talk about it. I might add this talk is based on what evidence we can find at geologic sites around the Spokane area in parts of Northern uh, Idaho and Western Montana. This presentation is a rerun of what, uh, of, of a talk given last fall for the Selkirk Alliance for Science in Newport, Washington, and is geared for the general public. Introductions. I'm Michael Hamilton. I've been introduced already, but I'll repeat a little bit of it. I'm a retired geologist residing in Spokane, for the Ice Age, and on the board of the Spokane Cheney chapter. My career experience includes much field work, such as geologic mapping of Eastern Washington for the Washington Department of Natural Resources, and a lot of looking around with other geologists, much more talented than myself and I uh, draw from both their observations and their publications. The setting for this talk, as I said already, is the Spokane area, and it includes parts of the Idaho Panhandle in Western Montana. This geology tells a very interesting chapter of the glacial flood story. While the scab lands and all the wonderful hydraulic features of central Washington have captured much attention, as you might notice behind me right now, the geology of Spokane area speaks of what happened just below the catastrophic release of water from a failing ice dam and reflects many details of what happened. Spokane is an area of ur urban development and is blessed with an active sand and gravel industry that has punched many holes into glacial flood deposits. And alert geologists can collect much information from the excavations associated with development. So let's talk about the great glacial floods. How do you visualize these events? They are labeled as the largest documented floods seen on the planet. You can almost claim they are biblical in scale. Hey, with this visualization, I should hope there's at least two geologists on board. Or maybe your imagination draws from Hollywood and the cinema that captures the catastrophic aspect of these events, surfs up here. Or maybe one chooses to wrap these events in, 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 in mystery and evoke something extraterrestrial in the realm of science fiction. There's one thing some humans, they overthink a lot of things and come up with a lot of interesting ideas, but that's the way science works. We come up with the ideas and then we cut them down to things that actually seem to represent reality. So tonight, we'll be sticking to the scientific approach. 
But be warned, there's a lot of fair, there's a fair measure of speculation in the mix. Uh, this is the picture you saw on the entry or the first slide of uh, the floodwaters coming through uh, Wallula Gap down near the Tri-Cities on the Columbia River. As to the fleeing mammoths, I think that's a little uh, artist's choice. However, I've always wanted to find bones of whatever was caught in the floods amongst flood deposits, and I've had very little of only C2 in the many years of poking around in flood gravels. I can imagine the floodwaters really destroyed most of the things that was in its way. Even the bones I found were ground down to cobbles. Now, the question that's always asked me, were there people there to experience the floods? To that, I say, I don't know. A Kennewick man is 9,000 years old. Some of the older, oldest human habitation sites ring in at about 11,000, just about when the last glacial floods happened. There could have been some overlap, but we yet have any evidence for that. So let's start with some history of the geologic model of the Great Flood. With past research, this will probably be a little bit of overlap with what most of you people know out there, but it never hurts to take another look, does it? There's a lot written about the glacial floods. And I have a few here, books and CDs. Uh, the two CDs really of note are Sculpted by Flood, KSBS's rendition, and the, the Mystery of the Mega Flood, which is a public broadcasting rendition. The other books are all good and good, good for everyone to read when you can. I think you all out there have time to read, don't you, nowadays. There's other books like this that have great geology. Oops, sorry. There we go. I have great geology of the Pacific Northwest and do include chapters and, and other things that uh, uh, include the flood story. Also, some of these books have road logs, so you can go out and look at the sites that they're talking about. Another good book, you can catch it, is Brett's Flood. That one is in publication, and I think you can find it. That gives you some of the real important history of the development of the glacial flood model. Okay, center stage, J. Harlan Bretz. Now, I can't imagine anyone out there doesn't recognize this character, especially the iconic photo of him on the left with this metal hard hat. Can't imagine how that worked in a hot Washington climate. But J. Harlan Bretz was a good geologist the young Bretz added the J to his name to add some interest to the rest of his name there. And there's no period after the J, a small factoid known by flood devotees. Remember that, and that will separate you out from the amateurs. There is some, um, but more important, his work on the flood science included quite a bit of field work in central Washington. During the 1920s, a little bit earlier and a little bit later than that. He found many landforms that were apparently made by large amounts of water, water that was nowhere to be found in the dry desert climate of this area. And he believed they were formed during the last ice age by very, a very large flood. The acceptance of his ideas was slow and contentious by his peers. <clears throat> the story is well known and can be summed up with the inscription on this plaque you see on your slide at Dry Falls, I quote, ideas without precedence are generally looked upon with disfavor uh, and men shocked uh, if their uh, conception of the orderly world is challenged. That's J. Harlan Brett's 1928. I think that's a pretty nice uh, uh, memorial to the man who worked pretty hard on this uh, geologic model. His theories were published uh, and uh, criticized and uh, finally accepted though, uh, pretty much when people could get up in airplanes and look down on these geomorphy or these, these features, landform features uh, in central Washington thereabouts, 
and confirm what he was saying about how, how they did call for a very large amount of water there at some time or other. But there were others too. This is Joseph Pardee. A Pardee uh, worked for the US Geological Survey. He did field mapping too, and he was based in Missoula, Montana. And his work, and also in the 20s, uh, consisted of, of documenting the occurrence of a very large glacial lake in Montana. And we'll see some of the evidence of that in a slide yet to come. He, uh, he didn't quite know where the lake went, but he did know there was an awful lot of water there. And for a while, he just wasn't listening to whoever was working west of him, who was Brett's, who ha had a very large flood to make the landforms he could see, and he didn't quite know where the water came from. Well, most of you know how that worked out. They finally listened to each other about time sure, and uh, put both those bookends to the glacial floods together to, to make the geologic model that we use today. This is setting the geologic stage because the great flood story, especially that of the dam and its ruptures, uh, depended on a kind of a perfect storm of conditions that were found in the Pacific Northwest. This map includes the topography and geography, so you kind of know where everything is. A first thing you might notice <clears throat> is that the mountains run generally north to south, and uh, the drainage runs generally east to west. So the drainage has to find its way through the mountain fences, so to speak. And water is just a great eroder, and it finds its way through water gaps in various places on these mountain ranges. Water gaps are something that uh, the names used in the eastern United States in the Appalachians uh, to, uh, to name the various water gaps where rivers flow from the west to the east into the Atlantic Ocean. Here, the drainage has the same, same task. Uh, water works 24-7 and is a, is a very erosional agent. And as these mountain ranges, like the Cascade Range, rose up, the Columbia River sliced down through it as it rose up and maintains its straight through exit to the Pacific Ocean. But we're going to look at a more specific spot that we're beginning to talk uh, about the glacial floods story and the ice dam. And that is where you can see on the screen, uh, the northern part of the panhandle of Idaho. Now this is sort of a, a interesting picture. At the bottom of the picture is Lake Ponderay. And the basin that goes straight north is called the Purcell Trench. Uh, this trench, uh, is structural in the, in the fabric of the mountain ranges. And structural means it's folded through regionally and very erodible because the rocks are shattered and drainage and other erosional agents have widened out a valley. Now this valley <clears throat> is a freeway for ice coming from the north. And as you can see, it's probably U-shaped. And U-shaped means it was carved by ice refilled with uh, debris as, uh, from retreating ice, glacial tilt, and what have you, uh, as far as uh, outwash. And it plays a part in the setting, the perfect setting we have here to set up the stage for our ice dam and the great floods. Now, looking further to the east, this is the basin in Western Montana that's fed uh, uh, from the, from the interior out through the Clark Fork into Lake Pend Oreille, which is just to the left or to the west of this picture. The basin is rimmed with high country that keeps a drainage contained. And this was the area that would become the reservoir from a blocked Clark Fork River. Uh, there could be some spill out uh, but uh, the depths of the water and the backup that formed this reservoir was hundreds of feet deep. 
Okay, let's go to the Ice Age. Now the Ice Age uh, started on this planet, the last one, about 2.5 million years ago with the global cool down. There have been other Ice Ages on the planet, by the way, and geologists know of a handful in the past by virtue of what we can find in the rock record. One of the more interesting Ice Ages was well over a billion years ago when we believe the whole planet froze up. Now, how can that happen? Run up, you know, why did it melt off? It's an interesting model, but that's another story. So our, our ice age, starting about, oh, the one we're concerned with uh, started about 150,000 years ago, but during the cool down from 2.5 million, there was a, uh, four major ice ages, otherwise polar caps forming on the planet, the advancement of ice sheets to the south. Now, pretty much the, the geologic history we're interested in was the last of these four, which is called the Wisconsin glaciation. That runs from 150,000 to about 11,000 years ago. Interesting, that 11,000 years ago to a geologist just is not that much time. And possibly, well, looking outside now, I can think more of ice ages than maybe August, but what we're doing to our climate by putting more CO2 in the atmosphere and warming up the sun could forestall the next major ice age advance. How's that for a bit of optimism, okay? Now, what you can notice on this map is there's two ice sheets. There's the Laramide, more to the east and central North America, and there's the Cordillian ice sheet, which came down the fabric of the Rocky Mountains, and this is the ice sheet that we'll be looking at. Ice never made it to Spokane. Now we're blowing up the scene to where we can see uh, our own local backyard here, Spokane on the lower left, a uh, sand point, under the white and the Cordillian ice sheet, this is its maximum advance. And the Purcell lobe went further south down that open valley that I show you in our early sign, the Purcell Trench. Now it covered over the Lake Andre area, which is shown blue. The interesting part about this as the Lake Ponderay Basin had already been excavated out and was very deep, over a thousand feet, probably by earlier glaciation than the one we're talking about, the Wisconsin glaciation. Otherwise, that valley was very fjord-like at one point and refilled with gravel on the retreat of that glaciation, leaving an open conduit though for the next glaciation to fill in with more ice. Also notice that there's a tongue of ice, the Clark Fork Tongue to the southeast that is now blocking drainage. That's a water gap. That's a cork in the bottle. And behind it, the backup of glacial Lake Missoula. Up and up it went. So let's move on and see what else we can find. <coughs> this is a wonderful map that a lot of us have seen. In fact, it's probably on our new poster out in Genie. It also shows the maximum advance of the Wisconsin glaciation. But what we can see on this map more than the other one, well, we see glacial Lake Missoula, don't we? Over to the uh, right-hand side, but around Spokane, we also see another large glacial lake and it's called Glacial Lake Columbia. Now this was backed up by a blockage of the Okanagan lobe to the Columbia River. And this is quite a large lake. Uh, water levels are thought to go up to 2,400 feet, which means if you're living around here at uh, 2,000 feet, you'd have 400 feet of water overview. And so it was quite a wet place. Matter of fact, we figure that Glacial Lake Columbia actually backed up to the base of the ice dam at, uh, at Lake Ponderay Bayview. Also in this map, you can see the drainage through the central part of the state. Uh, shows very well. And uh, you can notice drainage seems to spread out on the southern edge of glacial Lake Columbia. 
And, you know, there's a reason for that, which we will be talking about as we go forward. Okay, things were getting serious. Now, this is a little uh, deal I made to show the progression of things, but this, uh, to start with, shows this is uh, the hillside behind the University of Montana's uh, main building in Missoula. And as you can see on the hillside are horizontal lines uh, that represent wave cut terraces of a lake that's rising up higher and higher. Now, this slope's facing west. And so I figure as the lake level rose and when there was a windstorm uh, of note, uh, the waves would cut into the west facing slope, leaving those lines. Now, a lot of times driving through Missoula, you might not see these so well. They show up really well when there's a bit of snow on the ground. This picture, I'm just guessing it was taken about, oh, 12 minutes to nine uh, on a, a morning in the fall when the sun angle was just right to show those lines up. Now, remember, I mentioned Joseph Pardee's work in, in, out of Missoula and Montana, and he evidently saw these quite well as well as other strand lines in many parts of the valleys of Western Montana and could measure the high levels of the lake. Obviously the highest level here would be the top strand line. Water stays level. So if you have 300 feet of water here, you can stretch it right out to everywhere 300 feet of water would go. Obviously that water's not there now. Okay. Let's put our model together and see how it works. Uh, upper right is a panel that shows a previous slide with the uh, first ally sheet uh, and uh, Lake uh, Ponderé in blue. Uh, the red line's a cross section and below is the cross section. You can see the Lake Ponderé ice basin, deep but full of sand and gravel from previous glaciations. It powered out already. And to the right, we have uh, the Clark Fork topography. Okay, as the ice lobe approached, at first, uh, you know, it might not have had more than several hundred feet of ice, but there was a lot more coming down from the north. And it covered over the Lake Monterey Basin and started spreading out to the east, blocking water. There may have been not that much water at first, but the rapid advance of the lobe, which this calls the ice force, the Clark Fork Ice Tongue, would block more water and start actually the formation of Lake Missoula to the east. Now, of note, the seal for this water was between, I don't know, can you see, Mercer? Between the eastern side of the Lake Ponderay Basin and the front of the ice, and that was a seal on the bedrock that kept the water from leaking uh, through this lobe. However, I must remind everyone, ice makes a pretty poor dam. Now, as with progression of advancement of the Purcell lobe, ice thickens up. And now we're probably talking to more than a thousand, thousand and a half feet. The thicker the ice got, the deeper the lake backed up. And notice the eastern edge of the lobe appears to have migrated some to the west, and that is figured from erosion, uh, wave erosion, and uh, the frontal erosion uh, between the interface of water and ice. And so essentially, the seal on the bedrock is being reduced too in its length. Whoa, here we go. Now, the Purcell ice lobe is probably about maximum here. And we're talking maybe two or 3,000 feet thick. And um, things are not quite to scale here. I really don't think Glacial Lake Missoula was two to 3,000 feet deep. But it was deep. And of note, the seal on the ice lobe, the bedrock underneath that has now been reduced fairly short distance between the edge of Lake Ponderay Basin and where the ice meets bedrock 
This is a result of more erosion. Now, really, the Lake Ponderay Basin being full of I, uh, sand and gravel, it's not a great place to create a hydro seal for this backed up reservoir. And the hydrostatic pressures really are quite significant now at the base of the column here. The dam burst. Okay. Here's a model that's worth staring at for a while because it's got some very important information. The ice lobe, well, it seems to be distorted, but necessary for graphics reason, is, oh, I don't know, it has about 5,200 feet thick from top to bottom. Its bottom is resting on gravels and sands, and Glacial Lake Missoula, at this point, is tunneling underneath the ice lobe, and flows of water are coming from the bottom up to the, into Glacial Lake Columbia, which is lapping up on the western side of the ice lobe. Hmm. Well, this is interesting. Uh, it's called a density flow. And as the water started slowly, they picked up speed uh, as the erosion opened up tunnels, uh, extensive tunnels, to a point where bang, it was flowing at huge volumes and moving a lot of rock from the bottom of the Ponderay Basin. Now, Glacial Lake Columbia at this point would, uh, be going up in elevation. I think if you were there standing on a high spot back then at a good spot, I wish I could do that. All of a sudden you would hear, a, a, besides a lot of commotion to the uh, east, uh, northeast, we would see the glacial lake levels rising very rapidly and wondering what the heck's going on. It would continue to rise until it spilled out, creating the channel scab lands. So you can see from our perspective, we see it as a kind of a two-stage event of Glacial Lake Columbia fill-up, overspill, scab land creation. Now, this model is uh, it, it's really a good in explaining another event of the glacial flood model. And that is, how do you get multiple floods? Well, uh, as you can see, the subglacial tunnel eruption can reseal nicely when the glacial lake Missoula or the reservoir to the east is reduced in size enough to not only cut out the float factor uh, with the ice lobe, but to reduce the pressure enough so it just doesn't flow with any extensive force from underneath the ice lobe. And this uh, model uh, does a good job at explaining why we see uh, multiple floods, or repeating floods, almost at the same time frame over and over again. But we're going to see some more detail as we move forward to look at the local geology. There's others in the geologic community that think that the ice lobe was destroyed and the catastrophic flood came out in huge volumes and that sounds fine too, because there's a lot of ice involved, we're sure of that, in the floodwaters. But then they say the Purcell ice lobe then advanced to block off drainage again and forming a new glacial lake to the east. Now, I have a harder time with that visualization uh, of happening, where this model is actually uh, works just fine. Now, we don't have to invent anything because this geologic model already exists and is observable on other places on the planet today. It's got a great name, Yakalops. Go ahead, copy that down and pull that on a friend and say, how about a Yakalops for dinner? You know, that's a real neat term. It's Icelandic. Now, I can't show this video because of bandwidth problems in Zoom. This is a picture of a Yakalops occurring in Iceland. I think in the 1980s, and it really was a result of a subglacial or ice cap eruption, volcanic eruption. And this film footage was on a, a DVD from KSPS called Sculpted by Ice. And uh, it really is neat. If I were giving this presentation on a projector in a room full of you guys, I could run it, but not tonight. Notice the waters are very charged, very much charged with silt and sand and gravel. 
uh, and huge forces uh, of uh, water coming out from beneath the ice. This is a miniature example of what I think happens when the ice dam, dam burst. This is an a artist rendition of Bayview, Idaho, uh, where it was the, well, actually this is the extent of this ice lobe. And he's showing a Yakalops eruption in progress. Uh, I don't think he quite captured the, the thickness of the ice that was in the basin when we're talking thousands of feet instead of hundreds, but it does capture the Yakalops eruption, eruption, which may have started rather small and grew and grew. It would have been a slower drainage of Lake Missoula than the catastrophic collapse of the ice dam altogether, but we're still talking maybe seven, 10 days as opposed to two to four days, okay? And a lot of ice would cab off the front of the ice sheet from the eruption, accounting for all the ice rafted materials we find in the floodwaters as they flowed from the northeast to the southwest. Now, this picture is worth looking at a little bit. As you see the two glacial lakes, Glacial Lake um, Missoula and Glacial Lake Columbia. There's a little Sp Spokane down there, but you see a red zone too. And this sort of introduces us to uh, what we see in the Spokane area as far as geologic deposits. The Spokane Valley in places is very deep. I've heard the amount of 800 feet to bedrock. And of course it was covered by Glacial Lake Columbia at the time of the outburst floods. I think, and this is quite speculative, that early glaciation may have come far as Spokane, maybe Pines, maybe a little bit further to the west, and scooped out fjord-like the Spokane Valley to depths that heavy ice can do. Now, when Glacier Lake Columbia was here at the time of the ice dam bursting, uh, there was a deep section in this lake, and that deep section gathered rapidly a lot of the rock that was being excavated in the huge eruption of water from underneath the ice cap. Now today, that red area represents the Spokane Aquifer. The Spokane Aquifer, aquifer is made up of all those boulders and stuff that were ripped out from the late, bottom of Lake Ponderé and deposited rapidly to the deep part of Glacial Lake Columbia. Now, there's no mud or silt or sand amongst those boulders to keep water passing through it. So it makes an outstanding aquifer that we enjoy every day in every glass. But you do can note, you can notice here what I was telling you about as the eruption going into Glacial Lake Columbia, bringing the lake up, spilling out, forming the channel scablands. I think you can see it here along the southern edge of Glacial Lake Columbia that uh, the track of spillout and erosion uh, really looks like it all happened at once. So there. Okay, <clears throat> how many floods were there? One, 10, 100? The Spokane answer, there was one very large outburst mega flood and numerous smaller outburst floods. What I describe as the big Yakalops, we figured was about 17,000 years ago. Subsequent floods never matched that size or even came close to it. Uh, other floods prior to the big one have been documented, some of which actually go back 35,000 years ago. May have been out Orange due to meteoric events, big storms, we don't know. There's a lot we, we don't, at least I don't know about this. But let's look at some of the geology to see what the answer is in Spokane. The flood effects as we see them. This is a uh, gravel pit in central, uh, the Central Valley in Spokane Valley, and it's active. And they couldn't be more friendly, these people. As long as you had a hard hat, you're welcome to go in and poke around. You'll see some amazing pictures here. But the walls of these active gravel quarries are well kept up and uh, there are beautiful exposures 
of all that material that was rapidly deposited here in the bottom of Glacial Lake Columbia, the deeper parts, which was in the Spokane Valley. This is uh, the gravel quarry at um, Sullivan. And it's full of water. What you're looking at here is, is the Spokane Aquifer. Makes you thirsty just looking at it, doesn't it? That's our water supply. And to continue to mine that gravel, they've gone to a dredge. I think you can see it operating on a cable uh, in the buckets in the center part of the photograph. They can dredge up material. The material's clean enough so they don't have to worry about uh, polluting the water with sediment. And uh, it's, a, it's a neat operation. Um, they don't know what to do with these gravel deposits or gravel pits because they have to be protected because it's our drinking water. In this picture though, you can notice a lot of white dots in the background, which are very large boulders. As you get near to them, they get bigger and bigger. Those are piled there, they get out of the way uh, so they can mine the gravel that they can sell. Now there's two types of deposits, glacial flood deposits, and uh, also two types of deposits in the uh, Spokane area. The large picture, is uh, glacial flood deposits in, in Hangman Valley. And what you see there uh, in the darker color are flood gravels that backwashed up the valley as a, a big flood event went past, maybe not the biggest flood event, but a big flood event. And then above them in the lighter colors is the accumulations of the bottom of a glacial lake. Those are bar clays that accumulate year after year. Matter of fact, you can read them like tree rings uh, because the summer and winter colors inside those clays are different and you can actually count the years in between floods. It's a sequence that goes flood, lake, flood, lake, flood, lake, flood, lake. Here we go, right up the outcrop. We call them rhythmites because there seems to be a rhythm to them. Uh, to the upper left is a collection of uh, rhythmic layers down in Walla Walla. This is Burlingame Canyon. And this is a famous outcrop for geologists studying glacial history. And those count up in the dozens. I've heard the term 99 used. But in Spokane, we see it a little bit differently because this, this being one type of deposit represents smaller floods that we see represented in the Spokane Valley and outcrops like this. There's Linda McCollum being very brave or very foolish, I'm not sure, uh, backed up to a high wall of one flood deposit. Now we're not talking inches here, now we're talking hundreds of feet. Hmm, that's a loose gravel, isn't that amazing? Uh, and it's, um, it's just tells us that we're talking about one flood and was beyond the scale of a lot of the smaller, which really were regional too, uh, but not of the same scale. These gravels are very poorly sorted. You can see little and big. Uh, there's no uh, clays in them or anything. The water power was just too high uh, to not wash those away. Uh, they're imbricated, which show the direction of current. Uh, but what they all scream as this was deposited very fast. There's no doubt during any single flood, there was episodes of faster, slower, faster, slower, currents going around structures and all that sort of stuff. Uh, very interesting. At Indiana University, one of my majors was sedimentology. Spokane is a sedimentologist wonderland when it comes to these glacial flood deposits. Here's one of the walls of one of the quarries. Once again, you can see uh, uh, the water to the left. These are slip faces where uh, gravel bars were migrating to the west, rolling down a slip face to the right. It's pointing towards up, up, uh, up current. Once again, it really streams very rapid, rapid uh, dumping of this material in the low spot of the glacial Lake Columbia. Uh, just as a footnote down at the bottom, you can see uh, wave cut terraces on the western facing slope of the bank there, showing different levels of the aquifer waters. Hmm, interesting, isn't it? 
Yeah. Well, this is another interesting aspect of the uh, geology here as we're looking at. These are rocks. These are boulders. These are loose guys that were deposited here. And this is around Sullivan, a bit to east, a bit to the west, okay? Uh, and these are mega boulders. I mean, these are really impressive. <clears throat> now, big boulders throughout the glacial flood pathways are usually uh, attributed to ice rafting. I don't think so here, really. I think that the initial big eruption, Yakalops from Bayview, uh, had enough power to roll these dudes or bounce them down the Rathrum Prairie into the Spokane Valley into the bottom of Glacial Lake Columbia where it was deeper. Yikes. Uh, that, these are quite a collection of, of boulders. Anytime you go out to the Spokane Valley, you can see a lot of these white boulders along the river or piled up in various places. But it is truly really awesome in their size and the power of the water to do this. But we'll see something even bigger. Now, this is Spokane South Hill, though. I just want to throw a few things at you that I don't know. When they uh, redid High Drive, uh, they dug these up. Uh, to the left, uh, with my wife holding it, is a basalt boulder, and we're at 2,300 feet. To the granite boulder, that's an exchange student from Malaysia, and uh, they had to dig them up and move them. Uh, now, I don't know how you roll or bounce anything that size up on top of South Hill, so maybe there was some ice rafting too. But wherever you go, you find very impressive sizes involved with what we think was the big flood of 17,000 years ago. Well, Spokane's blessed with a lot of interesting rocks that can be put to use. There's Mike McCollum. Uh, we did a lot of geologic work together, and uh, he really has a grand view of this geologic model. Uh, but these are rocks put to work. And notice they're all light colored. They're all granitic. Uh, they're not the local rocks. They came from a distance, but they came in a haste uh, during the big outburst flood. Also, rocks have been work from the group in architecture, I mean, landscaping. Um, this is a picture of my front yard that I re-landscaped this summer uh, in time we all had this summer to do things like that. I'm trying to make it into a glacial flood landscape and using uh, rocks from the Spokane Valley and other places. Enough of that. Also very interesting is the fact that when we look around even more higher up than the floor of the Spokane Valley, we find these very thick deposits with pea gravel that go all the way up to the rim of the valley. This uh, collection here is below Arbor Crest Winery. There's a little bit of quarry on the bottom but those pea gravels go right up the slope. Now, we figure, we figure that uh, this uh, exposure of, of gravel coupled with one just like it on the south side of the valley, this is the north side of the valley, uh, indicate that the valley was full uh, after the big eruption, full of gravels to the top of the rim left and right. Otherwise, most of Glacial Lake Columbia was displaced and uh, was pushed out into the scab land. Uh, this is one of the big rocks uh, that was moved from the initial big eruption. This is in Hayden Lake, and it was pushed across the Rathrum Prairie from Hayden, or from uh, uh, to Hayden from Bayview. It's a building size, and it's hard to imagine a boulder this size being pushed by a force of water, no doubt, we're talking about one huge eruption from underneath the ice sheet. Uh, and not only that, the waters were charged with sediment and lots of other rock to give them a real punch. But this is one of the more impressive things in the Pacific Northwest, this rock here. Also in the Spokane Valley, this is the Dishman Ridge. This is a digital elevation model, which is uh, not a photograph. It's just made from uh, elevation uh, it's, uh, data that's been digitized. And you can see the high water mark uh, and the erosion that goes hundreds of feet up the ridge. A lot of the flood waters coming out from the Yakalops would have been in the base of Glacial Lake Columbia, but nevertheless very erosional. 
Upper left-hand corner is one of the gravel pits uh, that have dug out a lot of gravel. Now on the waning of maybe a, a large flood, sediment accumulated on the lee side of this ridge, you can see what we call a shoulder bar to the left. And these are important structures because they back up the valleys, creating lakes like Newman Lake and the Hauser Lake uh, behind these shoulder bars. Now, here is uh, a bathymetric map of Lake Pend Oreille. Clark Fork is, is on the upper right, uh, and that's the ice would have filled up this fjord-like basin all the way to the Bayview, which is in the lower left. The Yakalops eruption would uh, dig out or excavate the channel way between Clark Fork and Bayview, and as you can see here, it's been excavated out well over a thousand feet. And those rocks, those rocks that were excavated out are the ones I've been showing you in the Spokane Valley, exposed in the, uh, exposed in the, the quarry walls. Now this is a unique lake in its depth. And because of that, <clears throat> and uh, they've put a, uh, a naval base there with experimental uh, submarine facility. This is a stealth submarine. I'm surprised if you can see it, but it's there that they use uh, the dive and depth simulating uh, open ocean. It's still there and it's still working, uh, but I don't know, I don't think it's open to the public. And that certainly concludes what I wanted to say. Um, to review some things, from the Spokane view, what happened with the dam burst? It was a sub-ice tunnel eruption called a Yakalops. Uh, it was massive. About 17,000 years ago, one great big eruptive phase with a reseal of the basin and subsequent smaller floods. Uh, as the lake levels grew up and the hydrostatic pressure increased enough to uh, create another pass-through underneath the ice lobe for another flood, repeated over and over again until the end of the Wisconsin glaciation, uh, when the ice lobe melted and retreated, uh, opening drainage up as we see it today. 